Today's interview is with Dr. Alexander Osterwalder. Dr. Osterwalder is the founder and CEO of Strategizer. He is a leading author, IMD professor, entrepreneur, and in-demand speaker whose work has changed the way established companies do business and how new ventures get started. Ranked number four in the top 50 management thinkers worldwide, Osterwalder also holds the Thinkers 50 Strategy Award. Alex invented the business model canvas, value proposition canvas, and business portfolio map together with Yves Pigneur, practical tools that are trusted by millions of business practitioners from leading global companies. His books include the bestseller, Business Model Generation, Value Proposition Design, Testing Business Ideas, The Invincible Company, and High Impact Tools for Teams. Osterwalder obtained his PhD in 2004 in Management Information Systems from the University of Luzon. Welcome, Alex. Pleasure to be here. So, Alex, uh, where would you be now if you had chosen instead to become a pro beach volleyball player? Probably I'd be retired by my age now, and I don't know what I'd be doing. Maybe I'd still do the same thing. <laughs> but you know, I love I used to love that that sport. So that's a long time ago. <laughs> How has the discipline of entrepreneurship evolved in the 20 years since you first presented the business model canvas? So entrepreneurship is not new at all, right? But I think the discipline of how we teach it has evolved substantially. And, you know, I think a group of people together created this, this new way of teaching entrepreneurship. Steve Blank, of course, you know, has been really pushing this with uh, customer development. And then one of his students, Eric Reese, came up with a lean startup. And that was mixed together with our tools from Strategizer. And then many more have obviously contributed to this, but I think now it's a lot more professional. So we can learn entrepreneurship. We can learn, you know, how to do it. And then of course, you still have to practice, right? Because it's not by reading books that you, you know, you become good, good at something alone. But I think the, 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 the discipline is still changing quite a bit every year because we're putting new things to the mix that we didn't know, um, but it's a lot, lot more professional than maybe five, 10 years ago. There are a lot of pithy sayings that are associated with entrepreneurship. Um, your videos and books present a certain sprezzatura, making the difficult tasks of entrepreneurship look easy. How do you, however, set expectations for first-time entrepreneurs so that they can fully appreciate how tremendously difficult it can be to successfully launch a company. So anybody who says entrepreneurship is easy is, is simply lying to you, right? I do think we have now more tools to do things more systematically. But, you know, there's still, it's still this mix between art and science. Um, I do think more people can now become great entrepreneurs is not reserved to a few. And I like to <clears throat> kind of compare entrepreneurship education to becoming a doctor or a surgeon, if you want, right? You, you read the books about anatomy and physiology, just like the same way in entrepreneurship, you need to understand business anatomy and physiology. It's almost back to the basics. What's a business model? What's a value proposition? How do I test this? You, you, you can really um, deeply understand the fu fundamentals. You actually have to. And then of course, you know, like in, in medicine, you need to practice, right? In medicine, you go you know, after medical school, during medical school, you do internships. And the same in entrepreneurship. You won't get it right just by reading books, just like you won't get it right by listening to great entrepreneurs. Right? No doctor, no surgeon has become great just by you know being close to others. You need to do both. So you start. Very, very few might kind of get it right the first time, but that's the exception. Most you know, kind of get good the third or fourth time probably they've been part of a startup of a young entrepreneur uh, uh, enterprise a couple of times before they try it themselves, right? So you don't, you know, become successful in entrepreneurship overnight. However, you can now learn the basics of 
business anatomy and physiology to get better at it and then practice. So you'll get better faster. And, you know, maybe you're not a Steve Jobs, just like I'm not a Roger Federer playing tennis, but with the right tools and methods, you can get much closer to those, you know, great entrepreneurs who intuitively have been great entrepreneurs. In the entrepreneurship process, we often say fail fast and fail often. Yet the word failure has negative associations and connotations for people from different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds. How could we change the language of entrepreneurship, not only the word entrepreneurship, but the language that's associated with entrepreneurship to be more inclusive to student entrepreneurs from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Oh, because nobody wants yeah. to fail and the failure is never the goal, just like learning is not the goal. So basically any enterprise, any venture starts with an idea and the goal is working towards, you know, a real company, you know, 100 million or 1 billion, whatever your aspirations are. Um, so what you have to do in entrepreneurship is first accept that risk and uncertainty are at a maximum. And your job as an entrepreneur is not to build anything, not to write a business plan to start something. Your only task is to decrease risk and uncertainty before you spend a lot of money and waste a lot of time. How do you do that? <laughs> By experimenting. So you might talk to customers and you'll learn, oh, they don't actually have that problem, right? You just you know, failed or it didn't work out the way you, you thought, but you learned something. So you decrease the risk by learning and you'll do that. Maybe then the second thing you do is you create a landing page, right? Where people go and sign up with your email. You still kind of learn that what you had in mind is not the reality. So you're going to increase your investments in time and energy and money and experiments with the risk you're you're decreasing. And maybe at one point you'll say, look, there's nothing here. Couldn't find anything, <laughs> couldn't decrease the risk enough. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna change and, and do something else. Or, you know, you still believe in it, you pivot and find you know, some traction. But the point is, the goal is to reduce risk and uncertainty in a systematic way. First, very fast, very cheaply. And the more you learn, the more you'll invest. Maybe you'll make a digital prototype whatever, an iPad app at one point, but you'll only do that, you'll only build something when you have enough evidence. And then you'll start scaling when it really is starting to become clear that there's something there. That's your task as an entrepreneur, to reduce risk systematically and to increase your investments in what you're doing until you're really confident enough to scale this. And that's also how you're gonna get access to money, not by <laughs> pitching a great idea, by showing you have evidence that that idea has legs. And you'll increasingly you know, get more evidence over time with a series of experiments. It's how important are mentors and advisors and guidance um, for understanding the business model canvas and the value proposition? Canvas processes. And it, where I'm going with this, uh, Alex, is you know, should these be primarily uh, education tools for students before they can become process tools for entrepreneurs? So I, mean, I, I think mentors, yeah, mentors are incredibly important. <laughs> However, we do need to remember back to that idea that you know, we do entrepreneurship education just like we educate doctors and surgeons. It's not by having great mentors alone that you're gonna become a great doctor or surgeon. You do need to learn the basics. You do need to learn the fundamentals, in this case, in, not of anatomy and physiology, but of business anatomy and physiology. So if you don't really deeply understand how do business models work? How do value propositions work? How, how do I start creating? How do I test these things? Then mentors, you know, won't, <laughs> won't be good enough. It's not by being close to the smartest business people, smartest entrepreneurs on the planet and listening to them that you're going to be able to systematically 
do things yourself, right? So you need to you know, be able to understand these tools, these basic tools in order to understand how entrepreneurship works. And then of course, you want to learn from others, how have they done it? What have they done right? What have they done wrong? It is really important to learn from others, but you can't really learn from others quickly and deeply if you don't understand the business fundamentals. You advocate using many tools in the entrepreneurship process. Um, as you have said, the magic is when you bring the tools together with the right processes. The business model canvas is just a better and more modern version of the business plan if you do not combine it with testing and bring all the right tools together. Which of the many available tools are the right tools for an entrepreneur to use? And, 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 and when should they be brought in to the startup process? Yeah, I think, you know, the, again, the way I like to look at it is to say entrepreneurs are business surgeons that create new businesses, right? And surgeons, they're good at, you know, get, taking the right tool for the right task, putting those together. And entrepreneurship has many different phases in which you'll use many different tools. Now, fundamentally, you need a tool to understand the business, right? The business model. How are you going to create, deliver, and capture value? And that's one tool, right? We created the business model canvas for that. Then you also need to understand, you zoom in, how am I creating value for customers? That's a very specific part of your business model. And it's just one, but you might want to use a tool to specifically outline, make explicit how you're creating value for customers. And while that sounds trivial, and you go and ask an entrepreneur, how are you creating value for customers? They're going to rattle down the features and the performance of their solution, but they still didn't tell you how, why does that matter to customers, right? So you need a tool to do that. And then, of course, you need the right tools to experiment. You need to have tools to understand, how am I measuring you know, the reduction of risk and uncertainty? We created a specific kind of le level of evidence you know, tool and a, a project scorecard so we can score how much I reduce the risk of a, of a project. So there's all these different tools that you need to start to understand. That's early stage. When you get towards you know, scaling, you're gonna use completely different tools because now all of a sudden it's not about testing the business model. Now it's about organizational scaling. You're gonna to have to build teams very fast. So now we're more into HR. So we're gonna look at more HR tools. So every you know, different task in entrepreneurship has a tool set that is appropriate. And since you have many different tasks and many different phases, you're gonna need a whole kind of library of, of uh, scalpels to do the right, you know, kind of entrepreneurship surgery. You've said that business plans mass maximize your risk of failure because a business plan is just a fantasy that you have described in detail. Uh, you have also said that business plans are good execution tools, but are really yes. bad for innovation and entrepreneurship. Yet, I am seeing that the business plan is still being taught as a foundation for entrepreneurship at too many institutions. What would you advise any institution that is still teaching the business plan as a foundation for entrepreneurship? Well, <laughs> If we're talking about creating something new in an uncertain environment, by definition, a plan to execute a fantasy doesn't make sense, right? So in the past, we kind of took the, the tools from corporations. We're building a new factory. Let's make a business plan so we can get a return on investment. But we've already built one or two or three factories. So we know how it works and we know the economics and all of that. So there you can make a business plan. But now, if we're talking about creating a new value proposition, new product for new customers with channels we don't know yet, maybe supply chain, we don't know if it's going to work, a plan doesn't make sense. So back, you know, kind of to this drawing, when uncertainty is high, your task is not to plan the execution of an idea because there's high uncertainty. So your task is very different not to refine everything I'm going to do to execute that fantasy, but how am I going to reduce the fantasy part 
and make it more and more real. So you, business plans are, again, a great execution tool in a certain environment when you know what's going to happen. When you don't know what's going to happen, you should not emphasize execution because what's happening? Why is that maximizing risk of failure? Because you're going to put all your money into this plan and then everybody's going to expect you're going to execute what you put into that plan. People gave you money to execute what you told them is going to work. So they're going to believe you. But if a week later or a month later, you say, actually, the plan turned out to be wrong. The customers don't care. Now we're going to do this. Then the people who gave you money are going to say, but come on, you told me this. I gave you money to do this. So great investors, they don't ask for business plans and great educators, they don't educate people to make business plans because they know if somebody asks for a business plan, you should run as an entrepreneur because you're going to get money to execute something you already know that's highly improbable to work because it's your fantasy. So you need to get money from people who believe in you as a team to have the ability to test and adapt your idea until it works, right? So the key in entrepreneurship is not to execute an idea. The key in entrepreneurship, the most, the hardest part is to adapt your idea, to adapt your vision until customers really care about your value proposition and you have evidence to prove that until you have a business small that can scale profitably, right? So it's that until. And sometimes you're actually going to give money back to investors because there's nothing there. That's what smart you know, entrepreneurs do. And there's multiple examples where too much money led a company and an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneurial team to execute a fantasy because they had so much money, they didn't need to test. They could build it right away. Quibi is a great example. Yeah. You know, Meg Whitman and, and Jeffrey Katzenberg they built Quibi, this mini video platform that was going to compete, you know, against Netflix in the mobile age. Well, guess what? They raised over a billion dollars and they started building that fantasy. Now, what's pretty good is after six months, they shut down and the remaining money, they gave it back to investors. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, you know, famous figure in Disney um, and, and had a lot of experience in, in Hollywood, you know, he explains that. Well, he learned that you should not go and execute. You should be much faster in the iteration and adapting your value proposition and business model until it works. And there's multiple examples like that. And, you know, some very experienced VCs, they say, if you give a team too much money, they're actually going <laughs> to decrease the, 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 the probability of success because they're at risk of building something nobody wants. It, I'm... I'm very familiar with that. In uh, prior life, I was the uh, C-level of executive of six Silicon Valley venture-backed startup companies. Um, usually, I was brought in as the turnaround guy when that company had failed to execute on their business plan uh, and had spent all of their money. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why in the, you know, uh, 90s and early you know 2000s uh the, the failure rate for um, vc backed companies is you know 90 95 plus percent which we're all familiar with uh, and because they're based on the business on a, a business plan right. so but the, the thing I'd, the, there's one thing i'd emphasize is if we look at the entrepreneurship field, and if we look at how venture capitalists invest, we will always invest in a portfolio because even without business plans, even without that big failure, you know, where we invested in a big idea and it didn't work out, even when we go fast and iterate, sometimes you learn there's nothing there. But the good news is now we're going to learn faster and cheaper and we're going to call it quits before we may wasted a hundred million dollars, right? But we still always need to accept that there might be nothing there. And that's why venture capitalists mm -hmm. invest in a portfolio because they know one company in the portfolio is going to return the 90% that are not going to work out. And that's fine because they also invest in second, third, fourth time entrepreneurs, some that succeeded, some that didn't, because they know you can do your best job 
when there's nothing, there's nothing. You just can't know. Sometimes you're too early. Sometimes the technology doesn't work yet. Sometimes customers don't care. But the, the point is that we're going to waste less capital by getting a lot more systematic how we reduce risk. But we're always going to have one out of 10, and, and technically it's actually way more, <coughs> you know, companies that are going to succeed. So we need to accept not every idea is going to work. That's okay because you just go to the next idea. The goal is not to waste too much capital and time and to stop the venture um, when you learn there's nothing there. And the, the VC model is, is one of the many models that you've identified, right? Uh, um, it, you advise to move on and to shelve or retire an idea when there is not enough evidence that your hypothesis is true. Um, your tool, the innovation scorecard, has four categories and questions that are easy to understand, right? Uh, but very difficult to answer. So um, desirability, do customers actually want it? Feasibility, can we build it and scale it? Viability, can I make money from it? And adaptability, is this the right time and the right environment? So at, at, as an entrepreneur, again, I understand what the words are and it seems pretty straightforward. As an entrepreneur, how can an entrepreneur know how to answer these very difficult questions? <laughs> so at the beginning, you generally don't know most of it, right? And it depends a little bit on the risk profile of an idea. So if I stick to those four categories of risk, um, and I'll take a corporate example just to quickly illustrate. You take Lego. When they, when they started to look at Lego friends, so Lego boxes targeted at girls, first time they would do that, you could ask, well, okay, what's the risk profile of that venture? Do they know how to, to build those blocks at scale? Oh, yes, right? So there's no risk in feasibility. Do they have the distribution channels to reach uh, girls? Yeah, toy stores, very likely, you know, you have boys and, and girls that go to the same kind of toy stores, maybe not the Lego stores, right? Um, viability, are we going to make more money from it than we spend? Well, we know kind of how much it costs to produce the blocks. The price is probably not going to be substantially different from the, 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 the boxes I market to boys. So guess what? There's not that much uncertainty around pricing either. So the only big uncertainty is desirability. Can I come up with box sets, Lego friends that girls actually care about and that the parents are going to buy for their daughters. That's the only risk. So there's not a lot of risk. And you need to go and test to figure out, you know, can I make that work? And you're going to change the boxes and the packaging and the marketing, et cetera, until you have enough confidence to launch this. So there the risk is not very high. If we're thinking about ventures, same thing. You might start something where you know the feasibility. You already mastered the supply chain, so not a lot of risk there. We just reduced the risk of the entire idea to a little bit less, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, pricing. Ah, oh, it might be very different from the stuff I know. Good. Now you have viability risk, desirability. I don't know. So do you see what I mean? Now, mm -hmm. it, let's say Lego movies. When Lego launched Lego movies or when they, they reflected on should we start this, they didn't know anything. Supply chain. They've never worked with movie theaters. So no idea, right? Would the Lego brand work for movies? No idea. Can we make money from it? No idea. So desirability, would anybody care about Lego moves? No idea. So the risk was 100%. There's nothing that they knew. So you'd have to gradually kind of find that evidence. So it's the same for ventures. Some ideas are so bold and new, you're going to have to start getting evidence piece by piece. Are you going to get all that evidence in your first 12 weeks? No. So you probably start with do the customers have that challenge? Sometimes we like to say problem mm -hmm. or you know, objective. Do they have that? You spend 12 weeks talking to different customer segments and see, is there anything there, right? And then, okay, got something, got enough evidence. You go to the next challenge. Can I create a solution? So you break down these four big categories in smaller hypotheses, and you only test the most important ones, one after the other, right? So generally, you know, people, I think in particular, you know, engineers and scientists, they start with building 
because somebody told them, right? Eric Ries called it M MVP. You need to come up, build, measure, learn. But Eric Ries never literally meant build something. <laughs> it meant come up with a way to test your assumptions. That's where we made this whole idea of hypothesis explicit. Mm -hmm. And you might run a series of interviews and other things to first understand, do customers care? So while these questions and categories are broad, you break these things down, big idea. You break it down into these four risk categories. Each risk category is broken down into manageable hypothesis. And then you ask, which one is the most important one I need to test first? And it's rarely, can I build it? Right? The most important one is, do customers either struggle with that problem or doesn't always have to be a problem. Do they have that objective? Oh, my sales force wants to increase sales by 10%. It's not a not literally a problem. That's an objective. So those are the things you want to test first. So you take this big thing and you break it down into smaller hypotheses that you test. Is um, I, I see in advertisements, there's even a uh, now a Lego game show. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I mean, it's I certainly haven't watched it, but I think that uh, that can be another. Uh, uh, addition to your example, the Lego and, game. And Lego, yeah, Lego is actually pretty good at asking, okay, under the Lego brand, what are different things we could create to create value, right? Value propositions. Disney has been extremely good at this, right? Starting with the, with the movies. And then over time, they developed, you know, the, the, the theme parks and the cruise ships and you know, it's like a reinforcing kind of system, a flywheel, where every little piece, every different value proposition influences the other. So that's when you get really good at it, you're going to ask, how can I evolve my business model over time with new value propositions that mutually, you know, in, reinforce each other? For the business model canvas, um, th this is something that I, I have found challenging to understand. What is the difference between how we engage with customer segments and how we engage with key st stakeholders or partners? And so it, where I'm going with this, Alex, is, is you, know, you want to interview, you want to talk to, you want to understand you know, each of the different constituents, but you know, is there a difference really between how you engage with customer segments and the kind of key stakeholders and partner segments. So when, you know, you need to look at these things context specific and you're going to come up with all of the customer segments and all the stakeholders you eventually need to get right for this idea to work. But then you're going to ask, well, which ones are the most important? Which ones are most fundamental, right? So if you're Airbnb, we're going to ask, do I first need to you know, understand if travelers are interested? Do I first need to understand if hosts would rent out you know, their, their rooms, uh, their apartments, their houses? So you ask, which one do I need to attract first? And that's the one you go with, right? This is mm -hmm. one example. Or if you're selling to a company, um, you never sell to a company, actually. You're selling to different customer segments or stakeholders inside the company. <laughs> And Steve Blank actually has a really interesting model there where he says, well, you don't really sell to a company, you sell to the users. If you're selling software, you have users of your software. Do they make the decision if the company is gonna buy the software? No. So you might have influencers, you might have recommenders, then you have the buying committee or you have the you know, purchasing department and then you have the ultimate decision maker. So you need to map those all out and then ask, which one is most important that I understand first? And sometimes when we're selling software, we make the mistake to think it's the user experience that's going to influence the purchasing um, of my new software. Well, the reality is it's probably the buying committee you need to convince first. And then, of course, so you're going to test that. Can I convince the buying committee? And then, of course, over time, you do need to have a value proposition to the users. But as an entrepreneur, you always need to ask, if I need to get it right for all of these stakeholders, which ones do I need to get it right for first, right? And again, back to the software example, 
you know, am I, is, is the user going to decide if I buy Google Docs or Microsoft, you know, 360? No, it's not the user. It's the buying committee. It's the IT department. It's the purchasing, you know, department and so on. So you need to ask as an entrepreneur, which customer segment, which stakeholder matters most? And that's who you're going to test with first. Because if there's nothing there, you don't even need to think about all the other stakeholders and customer segments. So you need, always need to understand which one is the most important to start with? Many universities and colleges that do not have a center for entrepreneurship are looking to develop position and implement a center of entrepreneurship, one that engages and includes students from all disciplines, all socioeconomic backgrounds, genders, and groups. Centers for Entrepreneurship in academia have existed for quite some time, certainly since the, the 80s. And there were many templates for an inaugural director of a new Center for Entrepreneurship to choose from. Um, and you know they include programs like pitch competitions, hatcheries, hackathons, mentor programs, accelerators, incubators, speaker series, uh, internships, student venture funds, um, certificates in entrepreneurship, you know, the list is, is certainly goes on. However, each institution is unique in terms of its location, rural or urban, its funding source, public or private, the size of the student population, um, in terms of the number of undergraduate and graduate students, breadth of disciplines, whether it is purely liberal arts or including, does include a business school, a school of engineering, nursing school um, and you know divert and the diversity of its students okay that's a long preface uh, to a series of questions here Alex what approach should one take when advising a president of a university that does not have a center for entrepreneurship to implement a center I would always ask what's unique and what's not unique is, you know, the, the fundamentals of business anatomy and physiology are not unique business models, value propositions, how you test ideas. That's not unique that, you know, I think we can standardize and we do that to a certain extent with strategize or not for academia, but we do that for corporations. That's not unique. It's the same process in whatever industry you are in. It's yeah. going from an idea to reducing the risk and adapting that idea until it can work. Those, that's not unique at all. Now, depending on which field you're in, you will have unique things. Let's say we are, you know, um, um, a medical school, right? And we're trying to help our scientists to commercialize their ideas or their science. Well, guess what? Now you're going to start to teach things that are very unique to that field. Maybe how do you run experiments in a heavily regulated environment? That's going to be, you know, a little bit different in terms of the types of experiments that you run and that you can teach. The fundamentals that you need to experiment to de-risk your ideas, that's not going to change. But what's unique is how do I change in the health, how do I uh, test ideas in the health sector, which is heavily regulated, right? So that's unique. Um, or I can have experts that help me understand, you know, what are the things that, you know, are working today in this field? What is, what are, what things are broken? So you can have panels of experts, right? So you always want to ask what's not unique and I can get that off the shelf and I should copy this from others. And what's very unique to my particular field and even area you know, what do I have? Do I have mentors that are readily available? You go to the Silicon Valley or the whole Bay Area. Well, guess what? You're going to have the best entrepreneurs and venture capitalists who want to go teach, you know, at, at Berkeley and at Stanford because they want the name. In other regions, that's not the case. Switzerland, where I live, it's going to be very hard to get the best business practitioners to do this at university. Not so easy to get them because they're not as willing to give their time, you know, to pay it forward. So you really have to understand what's general, what's repeatable, it's the same everywhere, the fundamentals, and what's unique to your area and even to your region. And then, you know, talking about hackathons and this and that, 
you want to design a program, again, that will work for the types of people you're educating. Some will be more interested in hackathons, in particular when we're talking about coders. Great. That alone is not going to do anything, right? So you need to tie it back to the fundamentals. What do I need to have in my ecosystem so that a hackathon doesn't become, you know, innovation or entrepreneurship theater, where it's just an event? <laughs> Again, you know, pitch events. Great. Well, pitch events are very critical because sometimes they're there to do product demos. Product demos don't matter in entrepreneurship. What matters is the evidence that somebody cares about the product, right? So we need the right kind of um, pitch days. And that's again, back to the fundamentals. Those things don't change. So really go deep and understand your environment and then ask, what are the general things I can take off the shelf? And what am I gonna do that's very unique to my stakeholders, my objective, to my region that I'm working in? Suppose that I am an, a newly hired inaugural director of a uh, non-existent center for entrepreneurship um, at a uh, liberal arts university in the United States, say, okay? So how do I use your tools? Um, you know, how do I use your business model canvas, value proposition canvas? How do I use uh, other tools like design thinking, lean startup, and jobs to be done? Um, you know, it's... How do I be entrepreneurial about entrepreneurship development um, by using those right tools? Yeah. I, and that's a really interesting question, right? Because you're going to adapt kind of the design of this while you know just you know taking off the shelf what's off the shelf. So let's say we're you know in a music, we're teaching music environment, right? So guess what? You might have entrepreneurial projects that don't necessarily need to become a scalable business, but we still need to make more money than we spend. Could be, you know, by donations, you know, you have people who are giving money. It's, it's still the same logic, but you're going to adapt it to the very specific environment. Or let's say, you know, I did with my kids, I wanted to teach them entrepreneurship. We did a project where we created a business comic book for kids. So I took the exact same tools you know, business model canvas, value proposition canvas. My kids were then, you know, I think they were 12 and, and nine. They're simple to understand. So we did that. Then we asked, okay, what do we want to create? Well, a small business, not going to become something scalable, but we want a successful comic book. How could we test that? So we started to do that. And that was for the project of a comic book. It was never going to become a scalable business, but it was, you know, for this particular part. So that was with my kids. That was an, in, you could ask, well, what if I was a, you know, um, artist or a designer, I could use that for similar types of projects. So we're not going to work towards, like maybe in the Bay Area, towards a scalable, you know, business model for a unicorn, decacorn or whatever. But we're going to try to figure out how can we make money in design, in the arts? How can we make money from a project or just, you know, make money means also to just survive. <laughs> Um, in the field of music, of whatever else. So we've actually seen the tools take off everywhere in all different kinds of areas. Music, for sure, because there's more business model variety in the music industry than ever before. So that goes from the individual artist to record companies to platforms like Spotify. They all need to figure out a business model at various different levels of abstraction, from the individual to the band to the record companies and maybe to the intermediaries, right? Record stores or platforms like Spotify. But, you know, understanding how I can use these tools in other arenas than in tech entrepreneurship is incredibly important. And it doesn't need to be business in the traditional sense. It can just be managing a successful project. That's to a certain extent why we came up with the mission model canvas also with uh, Steve mm -hmm. Blank. Um, <laughs> so we could apply this to arenas where profit was not the mo mo the motive, but impact. So you will slightly adapt the tools to work on something that is not necessarily, you know, profit at scale, but we're talking about a mission that we need to accomplish. Using the example of uh, the University Entrepreneurship Center 
Um, you know, a, a university entrepreneurship center may have more than 30 customer segments, key st stakeholders, internal and external partners, you know, parents, uh, prospective students, um, you know, different levels of decision makers to be interviewed in order to identify, you know, jobs, pains, and gains, okay? So if you've got 30 or more that you're looking at, you know, how do you avoid, uh, you know, you had said identify the, you know, the, the key one first, but if you've got so many, how do you avoid analysis paralysis? Yeah, and, and that's a really good question because I see teams often getting stuck in analysis paralysis. They, they mistake that entrepreneurship is about understanding patterns, making decisions, and then making progress from idea to real impact or profit or business model. That's the goal. The goal is not to experiment, is not to fail, is not to learn. The goal is to make progress. So the question is, what are the fastest things I can do to move from an idea towards progress? So I'm going to ask, which ones, you know, which stakeholders, which customer segments do I really need for this idea to work? And maybe you just need to test with three and, you know, six, eight other ones. Well, we're going to do that over time. First year, doesn't matter if we get this and this and this wrong. So there's this wrong mindset that I need to get everything perfect. No, no, no. It's a gradual entrepreneurship. <laughs> is a gradual process. It's not like I'm going to turn the light on and now I know whoosh, I'm going to execute. It's not like, oh, analyze, analyze, test, 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 and then, whoops, I'm going to turn the light on and scale. No, it's gradually going to understand these most important segments. Then I'm going to start this. I'm going to adapt the idea. Okay, maybe in year two, I'm going to make it you know, even better for the students in the first year. I did what I could, but at least I got the thing off the ground. So year two, I'm going to do this. So entrepreneurship in general is a gradual exercise. It's almost like my, it, the, the way I like to use it before was I'd say my glasses get sharper, but then I realized you probably want to use the idea of a spotlight. It's not like you're turning the light on and then everything is clear. No, you're going to get some spotlights on this part of my, of my venture. And then I'm going to move on and I'm going to be able to illuminate this part. And then gradually I get more and more light. It's going to shine more and more light on more and more parts of my of my entrepreneurial venture. Profit, not for profit, university, you're not, same thing. But I always need to understand how can I fastest create more light? And you know, what do I really need to get from the first phase to the second phase? So we all even say sometimes in corporate entrepreneurship and innovation, sometimes you want to start even when you know it's going to fail, because you're actually learning about what's holding you back. And you can use that evidence to show it to stakeholders. Well, we need to do this and this differently to get to the next phase. So maybe some of your stakeholders, they don't want to release the money yet because they don't believe you. Well, I just showed you this. Actually, these parts work well, but I need more money for this part. And you've just shown to them with evidence. So again, you need to advance and do stuff. Analysis is not really what entrepreneurship is about. You do need to detect the patterns but you're going to detect the patterns by doing stuff in the field. And the light is going to get clearer and clearer and clearer. You work, Alex, with a number of professional accelerators. Uh, a university accelerator program is typically offered in the summer months to a cohort of eight to 10 teams, say, for eight to 10 weeks. So <clears throat> What can a university accelerator program and program manager take away from how professional accelerators are run? I think the, the process is very much the same. Again, I'm not an expert of you know, accelerators in universities, but yeah. you know, just from my limited experience in, in universities, it seems to me very similar from the professional accelerators. Now, the goal, again, you need to kind of see what the, what the objective is. If the goal is education, well, you might, you know, design the program in a slightly different way than if the goal is to raise money. Could be that it really is to help teams of scientists to commercialize their ideas. Okay, now you're very close to the professional um, um, accelerators. But it could also be 
that you just want to offer your students the experience of what entrepreneurship is. In academia, student generations are measured in terms of every four years, roughly. Um, how important are longitudinal studies for an entrepreneurship center for entrepreneurship, <clears throat> and and what should they measure? So we, what I'm what I'm asking here, you know, Alex is is, you know, it, it's how do you, is it important to to understand what these changes are in your uh, customer base? I guess is is what it is. Because the interest in entrepreneurship, I mean, it it changes all the time, right? Um, what uh, you know, what what are the benefits of doing these longitudinal studies? Well, I think there's some things we could really learn about entrepreneurship if we, and I think there's some <coughs> studies that go in that direction. Is you know how many <laughs> experiments? So first, you need to start with looking at the idea that the team is starting with, right? What's the risk profile? <laughs> so depending on the risk profile of the idea, you're going to have completely different behavior. If I already know how the supply chain and all that works, well, the team is going to have to do different things than an idea that is completely new. So you kind of already have to <laughs> compare apples with apples. But what can be really interesting is to study the behavior of teams, large scale, and then understand Oh, those teams that have run an experiment per week, they were more successful than teams that have run an experiment per month. And so stuff like that. But when you gather a lot of data, you're going to you know, really start to understand some of the characteristics of successful early stage teams, which we don't, I think, today have really good ways of measuring that. Or, you know, if you really go and, and qualify the different type of evidence. So I like to make the difference between what people say, what people do. And even in those categories, we, you know, we, we have levels of evidence. So now you could start to look at what type of evidence did the successful teams generate? What type of evidence did the not so successful teams generate? You can really start to understand, but you need a very large data set and the sa exact same process to be able to compare those things, right? Today, I don't think we have that in a very good way. Um, I think it could already be you know, interesting to look at the funding of teams. Did, did teams with more money <laughs> fail more often than teams that started out with little money and you know, got money over time? The way we kind of you know, say things really should be. So there's all these things that we could learn about entrepreneurship if we had the right way to measure this over time. So I think there's, there's a whole wealth of what we're gonna learn over time by being a little bit more explicit about the methodology of entrepreneurship, um, by breaking it all the way down to phases, to types of risk, desirability, feasibility, viability, adaptability, looking at the type of evidence that teams generate. But we're not there yet. We're far, far away from it. But I think there's a huge opportunity for research in the field of entrepreneurship. Um, many universities, uh, many university business schools, offer a major as well as a minor in entrepreneurship. However, I am seeing a trend where universities are seeking to encourage more student entrepreneurs by engaging all of the non-business, non-engineering disciplines across all of the colleges and schools at a, at a university. One approach they are taking is to offer a certificate in entrepreneurship that any student from any discipline can earn, okay? Most certificate programs require a student to take two foundational entrepreneurship courses, plus two to three electives um, that may also include uh, a practicum. So how would you approach uh, the dean of a university's college of arts and humanities, right? Not the business school dean, certainly, about developing an entrepreneurship-based course in his or her discipline as an elective course or a certificate in entrepreneurship. So, you know, let's just say it's, you know, arts and humanities, whether it's, you yeah. know, you know, how, how yeah. would you approach, you know, the dean of, of that uh, school? So what's interesting, what does 
entrepreneurship fundamentally teach you besides building a business? Like that's one thing for sure. But modern entrepreneurship education today helps you understand how do I decrease uncertainty in an environment where I don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. This whole idea of testing and then adapting in, in the case of, you know, um, business school, business models, the case of entrepreneurship and business schools to build a business. But in the case of, you know, whatever other field, there are also uncertainties. What's going to work? What's not going to work? So it's more like a mindset thing. How do I work in an environment where planning is not going to help me? Because if the world is uncertain, planning is not going to help. And given that, you know, there's more and more uncertainties in more and more disciplines, the whole idea of decreasing risk and uncertainty is the thing I would really pitch and then build a program based on that. And that might be around building a business because it's a proxy or, you know, using something like the mission model canvas to work on a project that has impact. Right? But what it fundamentally helps students do is learn about how to deal with risk and uncertainty and how to decrease risk and uncertainty and adapt my ideas or even adapt my behavior by testing, adapting, testing, adapting. So last question, Alex, what do you see as the next, uh, are the next evolutions in entrepreneurship over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, look, um, with my company, Strategizer, we're in a scaling phase, right? Now we created tools for early stage, you know, um, idea testing and adaptation. And we, we kind of created the tools to help ourselves even, right? But what we didn't really find is a lot of, is a really good toolbox around scaling. So I think that, you know, those phases that come a bit later on to scale and to scale rapidly, or just simply how do, how do I scale? Those different problems that you have once you did de-risk your idea and adapt the value proposition and business model to a certain degree, you're gonna have to, change the organization a lot faster. And that's a completely different job to be done. You know, how do I rapidly adapt my team? Well, you know, you're gonna, all of a sudden you're gonna have somebody who was the boss and now I'm gonna hire somebody on top. What's the toolbox for that? How do I deal with this, you know? So there are all those questions related to scaling. The second phase of entrepreneurship, if I may call it like that, once you did do the fundamental de-risking, I think the toolbox and the methods around that are only emerging. So I think there's going to be a lot there. Alex, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm very appreciative of your insights uh, on entrepreneurship. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure to, to chat with you.